you mentioned in your introduction the C word, COVID. And I want to start there. Unfortunately, I lived through COVID in Melbourne, which still has the record of the longest lockdown of any city in the world. We had the army and the police patrolling to make sure that we didn't move within three kilometers of our house. And you could imagine the uncertainty that occurred. And we know during COVID, there was death. There was unemployment. There was resource issues. There was equity. We closed our schools. We reopened them. We closed them. We asked you to switch overnight to distance learning. Believe it or not, there's an incredible amount of research already published on the effects of COVID on student achievement. And one of my colleagues, Klaus Zara, did the first meta-analysis on those studies. So he found about 40 studies that individuals have done around the world. And a meta-analysis asks two questions. Firstly, how big is the effect of COVID on student learning? Small effects, was it a big medium effect or a large effect? Let me ask you, I'll give you a hint. It was a negative effect compared to normal. No great surprise. Do you think overall the effect was small, medium or large? How many of you think it was a small effect? Medium effect, large effect, right? Now, the second thing that meta-analysis does, it says, okay, whatever the size of the effect is, what are the moderators, which is a fancy jargon word for saying, did the effect differ in Hong Kong compared to Melbourne with up student, bright students compared to students at the other end of the distribution in maths and English? And that critical question, sometimes people forget about. And then along came three other groups of researchers who did their own meta-analysis. So there's actually four meta-analyses. Interestingly, all four of them claim to be the first, and all four of them use different articles. And then along comes me. And what I do is I don't do original studies on the effects of COVID on achievement. I don't do a meta-analysis synthesizing the various studies. I do a meta-analysis of meta-analyses. And so when I ask the question, what's the effect? Interestingly, I only have about 12 to 15 million students, not a bad sample size. The effect size was tiny. And you can see all four meta-analyses, different studies all came up with the same answer, which makes my life easier. So the only question in town is why was the effects of COVID so small? And this is the beauty of meta-analysis. Sometimes data gets in the way of a good opinion. Everyone likes to talk about how bad it was, how disastrous, how terrible. No, it wasn't. The easy part of my work is collecting the data. The hard part is explaining it. And I'm spending a lot of my thinking time trying to understand why the effect of COVID, given how disruptive it was, why the effects were so small. Do any of you have any ideas about why the effect of COVID was so small? Don't tell me it was large. Yes, it might have been with some of your students. And if it was a large negative effect with one of your students, that means out there someone had a large positive effect, otherwise you wouldn't get an average so small. And that, average, that minus 0.5 is about the same size as what students lose over the summer. Not much. But why was it so small? That is the only answer, sir. No, you're right. And it's fascinating that I had to come to Hong Kong for someone to say that first, because everyone usually says it was about the resources, it was about the parents, it was about the curriculum, it was about all. No, it wasn't, sir. You're right. It was the teachers. You made sure that learning didn't stop. There was no such thing as learning loss. There might be a slowing down, but it was not a learning loss. And I think we've learned a tremendous amount. Now, 
here's some of my arguments about why it didn't get, no, and it all comes back to your point. It's because of what teachers did. And I think that the biggest travesty of COVID is that we learn nothing. And two, one, two years later, isn't it frightening how we've rushed back to the old normal as if it was the answer? And I encourage all of you to think of the positive things you do did during COVID, the positive things you do in the regular grammar of schooling, and how can we learn from that? Now, the reason I introduced this to start with is to give you a sense of what my work is about, matter analysis. It's trying to find out how big effects are. It's trying to come up with relative claims. How big is this effect compared to other things? And it depends very much on other people's work, building it up. And it asks also that second question, where are those moderators? And I have to say, I struggle to find any. Sometimes there are some, but it's not as common as everyone thinks. In my political job, I meet schools and principals all the time and teachers. And what's the first thing they always tell me? My class is different. No, it's not. Right around the world, it's not that different. It doesn't mean to say we shouldn't still look for it. 2008, I decided I would take all the 800 matter analyses and write a book to get it out of my system so I could go back to my day job, which was not in this area. It didn't quite work that way. It kind of got carried away and uh, for some reason it hit a nice spot at that time. I think it's partly because the, I changed the question from what works to what works best. Last month, March this year, I released a sequel. And I called it a sequel because it's not just the old book updated. I spend a lot more time in this book talking about the story, the explanation. I'm trying to understand what makes the difference. And yes, I increased from 800 meta-analyses to 2,100. I now have about 400 million students. Not a bad sample size to ask, what are the relative effects in terms of the size of effects on students? And I make no excuse that my work focuses on achievement. I don't understand what schools would look like if achievement wasn't a core part of their business. I'm delighted to say that other people, and I've been involved in some, are looking at the effects on affective outcomes, on self-concept, on self-regulation, and on learning strategies. And I hope others look at some of the other aspects, like physical attributes of students and so other things. But my focus has been mainly on, certainly in the visible learning work, has been on achievement. Here's the distribution of all the effects. Now remember what an effect is. In COVID, it's what's the effect of the improvement during 2021 compared to previous years? Or it could be, what's the effect of introducing a policy compared to not having a policy and calculating into the effect side? The numbers don't really matter, the relativity does. You can see here, here's good news, Hong Kong. There's hardly anything we do to students that harm them. Isn't that good news? 98 to 99% of things that we do to students to improve their achievement. All you need to improve a student's achievement is a pulse. That was a joke. We've got to stop saying, can we improve achievement? Everybody can. Which is why every policy works. Why every teacher in the world can argue correctly that they have evidence that what they do improves achievement, as everyone does. Now, quite a few of these down here are perfectly sensible. The effect size of bullying, minus 0.3. The effect size of boredom, minus 0.5. Yeah, there's a couple down there that should worry us that we have control over, but most of them are sensible. And my fascination, and what's taken me 20 to 30 years to work out, is what is the common denominator amongst these teachers and schools compared to these. I'm not greatly interested down there. And I do want you to notice that 0.4 turns out to be the average of all the effects. That's it. There's a tremendous number of teachers and schools who are above that average who are doing a stunning job. Excellence is all around us. 
And I don't understand why as a profession we don't esteem the excellence that we have around us. Believe it or not, the public does. 90% plus of the public think schools are doing a very good job with their students. About 30 to 40% of teachers in Hong Kong and Australia think that teachers are esteemed by the profession. We have the problem. When, I can assure you, incredible amount of teachers are well above that average and doing a stunning job. So what is the common denominator between the red zone and the yellow zone? I'm not going to introduce the data today. Just a limited amount. About four years ago, I produced a website, free website, MetaX. And I update it. In fact, I'm updating it next week with all the data on it, 2,100 meta numbers. So if you want to know all the details, look it up on your iPhone, look at MetaX, all the data's there, all the descriptions of terms, frequently asked questions, and we continue to build MetaX. I did it partly because I wanted to ask my academic colleagues and the audience. Yeah, I have the world's best critics. Many of them criticize the details. No one has come up with a different story. So I said, look, I'm going to save you 40 years collecting the data. There it is free. You can have it. Come up with a better story. And that's my challenge. Here's some of the negative effects. Not, I'm fascinated with these. But I do want to turn the equation on its head because I'm more interested in studying success and scaling it up. But I did want to give you some of the negatives. And that not labelling students, I've got it up there as not labelling, but if when teachers label students, it has a minus 0.6 effect. Happy to come back to in questions. What about some of the zero, close to zero effects? And you can see why a lot of people don't like me, because sometimes their pet subject, their pet belief, comes up here. Now, again, I want to hasten to warn. Sometimes when the effect is low, we should accept the evidence and ask why it's low, and that's how we can improve it. And I want to come back to that claim. Because during tonight, I want to look at some of those low effects and understand them. But what about the top effects? Now, I'm going to switch. A lot of the things that are in the yellow zone are structural things. Playing with the curriculum, playing with the assessment, playing with the way we set up our schools. Yes, they're positive, but relative to what matters, not even in the ball game. Everything is in the hand of the teachers, the school leaders. And when you look down that list of the top seven big ideas, you won't find a student. It does not matter where they fall on the achievement, where they fall on socioeconomic status. It's the same influences that affect them. You won't find an age. It doesn't matter whether they're 5, 15 or 25. You won't find a country but. A few years ago, we actually found a thousand different randomized studies and meta-analysis from developing countries. And we were particularly interested in looking at those. We then struck a problem because the United Nations have declared that developing countries is a dirty word. You can't use it. Um, you can't use any of that. Does anyone know what the official language is for those countries now? Which one? No, that's banned too. Here's the irony. I live in Australia. The official language? Global South. It's the language they came up with. You can tell someone from the Northern Hemisphere invented that word. It's different. But look back here. And there's no subject. Sorry, maths and physics and phys ed and arts teachers. It doesn't matter. Of course, the content differs. And I think this is one of the most fascinating things, which many people get upset about. But hey, I only got data. Look at the first one. When teachers work together to evaluate their impact, it has the biggest effect on the students and they're not even in the room. 
Now, of course, it, mean, it means important. What do we mean by evaluator? And what do we mean by impact? And I want to come back to that. Teachers who have high expectations tend to have it for all the students and are successful, and teachers who have low expectations tend to have it for all the students and are not successful. And you can see part of the theme coming in here. It's not what teachers do that matters. It's how teachers think about what they do that matters. And I struggle when I look at teacher education programs and professional learning programs. It's nearly always about what they do. Here's what I do. Come and watch me. I will share my resource. And I want us to stop it. I do not care less how any one of you teach. I care about the impact of your teaching. And that's the discussion I want to have. I care that you translate those high expectations to students, which is why we're obsessed about success criteria using the Goldilocks principle. Setting those success criteria not too high, not too low, and not too boring. After age eight, students want to be challenged. And if you don't challenge them, they will challenge you. And I just caution to go to Graham Nuttall's work where he found that in any one class, 40 to 50% of what is taught, the students know already. The biggest problem in school is the work's too easy, not too challenging. The biggest problem in school is teachers think students are engaged when they're doing the work. And in a lot of doing, there is no challenge. And it's then, how do we make sure the climate of the classroom and the school is one that's conducive? And I do get frustrated when people say, oh, what he found was that teacher-student relationships are important. No, no, that's not quite what I found. Yes, they are important. But just as important are the student-student relationships that teachers build. But both of them are for a reason. You build relationships like you invest in a bank so that errors are seen as opportunities to learn and not embarrassments. I'm at the stage now I have six grandchildren, which I'm all in love with. My oldest is seven, and she is already learning. That if she doesn't know the answer, look like you do and hope the teacher doesn't pick on you. She is learning that not knowing is an embarrassment. And that is not an aspect of a good learner. I think that's a really worrisome notion. And I asked, for example, what happens if I came into your class and I asked your students, what do you do when you don't know what to do? What would your students say? If they're like every student in the world that I've ever asked that question, they all say the same thing. Oh, I'll ask the teacher. Watch them. No, they don't. The students who put their hands up know the right answer or think they do. The ones that don't hope they don't get picked on. That is not a healthy situation, which is why I'm so obsessed with errors and mistakes and misunderstandings. No child comes into your classroom to learn that which they already know. And that is not how the students think. And yes, I want to maximize feedback back to the teacher, and I have this relentless focus on learning. I have a dirty secret for you all, teachers. I know you're obsessed with teaching, as you should be. Your students don't care about teaching. They care about learning. And that is not a common discussion in our textbooks, in our teacher education, or in our professional learning. Come back to this. Underlying all these notions is what I'm looking at now is this notion of evaluative thinking. This is the big idea that distinguishes those teachers in the red zone from those in the yellow zone. It's how they think. It's how they come to judgment. It's how they come to investigating their bias. It's been critically looking at evidence, and let me be careful. Evidence isn't just the work that I do in visible learning from meta-analysis. Evidence is the artifacts of students' work. Evidence is their noticing. Evidence is the test scores. And in my academic career, which is not related to visible learning, I'm a psychometrician. I'm a test person. And my fascination in measurement and, th and statistics is the interpretations we make. But so often, test scores are about the numbers. I want to know that critical thinking. I want them to focus on impact. I care very much that very successful teachers look for evidence where they're wrong. 
yellow teachers in the yellow zone, they look for evidence they're right. Well, I have to confess, I've done that often in my teaching. I look around and I ask a question and David answers it. So I think, yes, you all understood, because he did. No, you didn't. I should be looking for the students who didn't understand to improve my impact on their students. And it's interesting that last century uh, philosopher of science, Karl Popper, argued that science progressed for looking for evidence of error. Same notion here. And it's probably no surprise because this dates me. Karl Popper was my teacher as a, as a graduate student many years ago. Now, in my sequel that I've just published, I'm focusing on these five big ideas. And tonight I want to concentrate on a couple of them. So let me go. Firstly, to the purposes. Teachers, the purpose is to find their impact through the eyes of their students. And I want teachers to become, I want, the, I want the students to become their own teachers. It's interesting when you look at the effect size of student control over learning, it's zero. Novices don't know what they don't know. They need you. And a lot of the language about students' control over learning sounds right, it's seductive, but we need to be really, really careful. And the argument I put is I want the students to learn to become their own teachers, to know what to do when they don't know what to do, to know how to seek help, to go to an expert, which is why we're needed, teachers. I wrote a book a couple of years ago, which I'm very proud of, on visible learning for parents. I'm very proud of it because I wrote it with my son. And our argument in there is parents are not first teachers. And wow, did we see that during COVID. Parents are first learners. How they learn, their students learn. Sometimes that's not a very powerful notion. And so on down the list. What is the purposes? We looked also about the ways of thinking, because as you heard me say, I care deeply about how we think. And we've come up with mind frames this is the cases for teachers and leaders. We have mind frames for students, mind frames for parents, mind frames for climate. But tonight, these are the 10 big ideas. Now, to be honest, there's one repeated 10 times, number one. And you've already seen the effect size of that. I'm not going to go through all these tonight. But I'm going to use this notion of how we think to make my case that I want to come to. There's the student mind frames. And you look through those and you can see the incredible importance of this concept of learning. The notion of challenge. The notion of confidence to take on challenge. And I particularly note that with some of our brightest students, like gifted students. It's fascinating. Why is it the majority of gifted students do not become gifted adults? Less than 2% of child prodigies go on to gifted adults. When many of those students get to the age of 14 and 15 and they're forced to do subjects they're not expert in, they have no skills to fail. And what's more, many of their parents won't let them. And as I often said, particularly during COVID and my academic, my, my psychometric career, if a student gets 100%, the work was too easy. That's a hard pill to swallow for many students. But how do we allow our students to go to the edge of what they don't know and have the confidence to fall over and know there are safety nets called teachers there? As we're going to see, many of those gifted students prefer that teachers talk more and focus on the facts because that's the game they're winners at and that's the game they want to perpetuate, but it's not necessarily in their best interests. But this notion about evaluating their own learning, having multiple learning strategies, understanding as a teacher when a student doesn't get a problem right, Asking them to do it again and use the same learning strategies will come up with the same answer. They need different, and many of them don't have different. You'll see how we're going to come back to this. Here's our one for parents. I'm sure if you're skimming through these, and I'm sure we'll find a way to make these slides available. Yes, we can. Good. I'm sure it's going to be on your light page. Um, same kind of messages right throughout. It's how they think. And we're working at the moment on the cultural ones because certainly what I'm arguing for school leaders, your biggest impact is on the climate that you set up in your school across your teachers. 
And I hope in your school you don't have a school of 60 independent contractors, but you have a school where there's a common understanding of what it means to be a learner. And it's a safe place to fail, and it's an inviting place to come back. The biggest predictor of adult health, wealth, and happiness is not achievement at school. It's the number of years of schooling. And if I was the minister here in Hong Kong, my first act would be to lower the school leaving age to 10. Wow, would you solve the problem of making your schools inviting very quickly? Probably wouldn't do that, but because it's got perverse effects as well. But how do we make sure that our classes are inviting? And from a student point of view, I'm not a fan of looking at achievement gaps. I got news for you, Hong Kong. You will never resolve the achievement gap. It is not true that every one of your students will become Einstein or Madame Curie. There will always be an achievement gap. But every child can learn, and some of our best teachers and our best learners are those who start down there and make phenomenal learning. And as I've indicated, sometimes our top students don't make the same kind of growth. And I'm greedy. I want growth and achievement. I've talked about error failures. COVID showed our students were incredibly resilient. Many of them had wonderful coping strategies to deal with adversity. And so I'm not so fascinated in stress and burnout, the workload. I'm fascinated with the coping strategies that we have to deal with those situations. They will happen. Are we preparing our students for that uncertainty by giving them strategies? And I've talked about high expectations and every student who walks into your class, walks into your class with incredible, deep resources of motivation. Sometimes they choose not to spend those motivational resources on our work. Now, don't tell me your students are not motivated. They ask the question, why should I do this rather than that? And sometimes they don't answer that question as we would want to. You can see the incredible power of challenge the ability to go to the edge, the ability to climb the mountain or go down the rough water stream that is often not present in many classrooms. You can see the leaders and your power create a shared narrative, which I would want to be about what it means to be a good learner in this school. What are the attributes of the learner in each school? And we do a lot of work and our visible learning work around the world. We're a team, I have about four or 500 on the team. We work in about 10,000 schools in any one year. And one of our first things is asking teachers, what do you think a good learner is? And our experience as teachers are very rich in describing what a good learner is. Then we ask the students in the school, who's a good learner in this class and why? What's the nature of a good learner? Guess what they say? A student who comes prepared, sits up straight and watches the teacher work. Compliance. And when we put the teacher's comments up in the staff room and we put the student's comments up, suddenly there's a realisation, uh-oh, our notions are not getting across to our students. We don't want compliance students only. We want students to be the critics and conscious. We want, and we know, our students are going to create their futures. We're not. We better get it right, guys, because those kids are going to be the politicians and the entrepreneurs as we get older. And so what we want becomes very critical. So how do we teach them to become that critic in conscience? And so the climate of a school, the narrative of a school, is about fairness. fairness. It's about predictability. It's about being okay to fail and safe to fail. It's making sure everyone is exposed to the same curricula. Let me emphasize that. One of my strong themes in the book, particularly around labeling, is any kind of streaming, any kind of trapping, any kind of in-class grouping based on achievement, there is no winners in that game. And I'm following what Italy has done a few years ago where they banned it, and the two teachers' unions in, this, in New Zealand have just come out, and they're about to ban all kinds of grouping. And I think it's a really good move. And if you think your students don't know why they're in the elephants group, you are mistaken. And that it sets incredibly low expectations. Our job is to help maximize the variance in our classrooms because that's the world the kids are going to live in. 
and not set up structural barriers that indicate to students they're not going to succeed. Now, I know that's not an easy thing to say. I know it's got major implications, but we're losing too many students here in Hong Kong and in Australia who become adults who are not given the opportunity of a rich curriculum and they don't succeed. And they're probably going to be the next Elon Musk's, the next Madame Curie's and, and so on. Every one of them needs a rich curriculum. Let me come back to that. So tonight, I particularly wanted to talk about this notion of instructional and intentional alignment. And in 2008, I really struggled with the whole notion of teaching. And I came up with a, a league table like this. And if it doesn't confuse you, it sure as earth confused me. And you can see that you know, individualized instruction, discovery learning, problem-based learning, collaborative learning is all incredibly low. And wow, did I get some horrible emails from people about that. And you can see explicit instruction, direct instruction is very high. Wow, did I get some horrible emails around that. And I kind of agree that I didn't explain it very well. And so I spent a lot of time trying to understand why these are like. Now, don't get me wrong, problem-based learning, very commonly used in first-year medicine. You don't need to do another study to know it has a zero to negative effect. So what's going on here? All right. I want to start first with this notion, cognitive complexity. And a lot of the work comes out of Hong Kong. The work that John Biggs was doing, uh, Ference Martin was doing, Nancy Law was doing, I knew all about that when I spent a lot of time in your country in the 1980s and the 1990s working with those people. And they had solo taxonomies and I'm sure you've seen of Bloom and Webbs. And I use the notion of surface deep and transfer. The knowledge, the content, the concepts, the knowing how, the relationships between the ideas and the knowing with. How do you take knowledge and use it with new ideas, the transfer? Now, the jargony words I know, surface deep and uh, transfer is easier. But John pointed out to me about five years ago when I was talking to him, he said, you use the word transfer different from me. And unfortunately, many teachers use the word transfer like John does, shallow. That's not what I meant. I meant content and facts. I'm using both now. Because I know if I got rid of surface deep and transfer, people would say, what, what's knowing that? What's knowing how? But I do want to make that notion and that distinction between the content and the facts and then what you do with it. That difference isn't as great, even though there's hardly any evidence that's ever taught in the classroom deliberately. But that difference is the most important. That's the first step I want to make. And whilst it looks simplistic, it took us a long time to get to this point of looking at the complexity. Now, here's the problem. When I analyze classrooms, and I have about um, 20,000 hours of classroom transcripts, I've done a lot of work looking at um, classroom observation work. And uh, across those 20,000 hours, classrooms are dominated by facts. 90% plus of what teachers talk about is about the facts. 90% of the feedback, oral or written, is about the facts. 90%. Of the assignments and assessment tasks we give to students can be answered by knowing the facts. A good learner is a learner who knows lots. And there's a conspiracy. Students above average want teachers to focus on the facts more because that's the game the winners at. And so students think that learning is about the facts. Is it? I don't want that. I want both. I want the facts, and I want the knowing how. And so when I look at all these things, my answer is simple. Two. Why don't we have two success criteria? One about the facts and knowledge I want you to know, and one about the deeper relationships and extensions and transfer you want to know. Why don't we have two assignments? If you did my course at the University of Melbourne on structural leadership over the last 10 years, I have two assignments. The first one, believe it or not, is I want you to calculate an effect size on your school's data. The second assignment is about interpreting that. And I deliberately separate them because I know if I put them together, believe it or not, I'm actually a nice person. 
And I say things like, well, you got the effect size wrong, but I love your interpretation or vice versa. And I know the students will walk out of the room and say, oh, that course, oh, it's about calculating effect sizes. No, it wasn't. It was calculating effect sizes and interpreting them. Separate them. Make it very transparent and clear. Have two assignments. Have two tasks. Tell the students, this is about the knowledge and skills I want you to know, and this is how I want to use them. It's that simple. And right through this notion, and you're going to see, if you make that distinction, and I invite you to be greedy, want both. We've got to stop saying, is it facts or is it depth? We've got to stop talking about deep curriculum and precious knowledge. It's both. And when I look at so many schools' mission plans, it's always about the deep stuff. The students need the knowledge before they can go and problem solve. However, 90% of what we ask students to do is about the facts. We have a model of learning. In this model of learning, we go from teaching the students about what the knowledge is, consolidating it, and moving down to the deep to the transfer. We make the argument when a student walks into the room, they walk in with certain prior achievements, uh, culture, family, working memory. They work in with certain wills, confidence, growth, grit, self-efficacy, all that stuff. And they work in with certain motivations. Why are they there to pass the test because they have to or because they want to master. And those are our three outcomes as well. And when I analyze the different learning strategies, and we started with about 400, and we wanted to come up with the top 12. We kind of did, but in this area, there's a massive moderator. It depends where you are in the learning cycle. Take memorization. When you first expose students to knowledge, it has an effect size of 0 0.03. When you consolidate, it jumps up to 0 0.76. Does memorization work? Yes, at the right time. And you can see when students are first acquiring, it's that ability to outline and summarize that matters. And I invite you teachers, next time you're teaching a class, say to the students, I'm going to talk to you for 10 or 15 minutes. And during that time, I want you to take notes. I'll give you time to organize them then I'll collect them in. Many of your students will hand in a blank piece of paper. Worse, some will hand in a verbatim script of everything you said, which means nothing was happening here. I don't know about you, but I learned to outline and summarize when I went to university. Five-year-olds need it, 15-year-olds need it. They cannot, we cannot cope with incoming information all day. And many of us know that after five or 10 seconds, that teacher's gonna talk on and on and on, give up. They need coat hangers. I'm not sure we're very good at teaching consolidation over learning. And then you can see that when you go to the deeper stages, like take deep consolidation, that's when talking aloud matters. That's when self-talk, self, this is the work, Nancy, that we've been talking about. This is when it really matters. Does talking aloud matter up here? No, it has a very low effect. There's a right time and the wrong time for the strategy. We had fun at actually trying to come up with a name for our model, a sticky name. We call it the Kenny Rogers model. You've got to know when to hold them. You've got to know when to play them. There's nothing wrong with the strategies. It's a matter of when. And I go back also, Dean, to Ferenc Martin, who did a lot of the work on memorization and trying to understand what he called the Asian learner about why we're so good. Because you actually move through the four stages much better than in the West, where we parody deep learning. We don't like it even though it's the focus of our classrooms. My challenge, every one of you in this room has thousands, if not tens of thousands of measures of achievement. How many measures of learning have you got? How do you know how your students learn? Last year on our Family Foundation website, we have a, a free survey that looks at that, those top 12 strategies. And your students can do it, you can do it with your students, and you do get a report about how good the students are in the various strategies. Now, we haven't gone to the next step. There's a right time to use them and a wrong time. We also provide the student, or you, and it, it's with lots of resources to follow up each of those strategies. Because our aim is to say, how can we get more teaching of the learning strategies? We're working now on how do we make sure 
that the students are using the right strategies at the right time. Now, many of us have a very fancy name for that. We call it self-regulation. I call it Kenny Rogers. How do you know when to memorize, when not to memorize, when to talk aloud, when not to? How do you know to make sure that when you teach a task, whether it be about the, the knowing how or the knowing that, we are actually also teaching the right strategies? Because many of our students are using a strategy at the wrong time and wonder why it doesn't work. You don't need to have 100 learning strategies. You just need to have a small amount that you can go to if the first one doesn't work. When I look at teaching methods, Bob Mazzano published a book, 400 Teaching Methods. We took it and said, thanks, Bob. And you can see, 350 we threw out the window. They have got no relationship to learning. They are random. No wonder a lot of our teaching is a mystery to our students as to what we value. And it's no surprise that a lot of the more explicit instruction are more successful for knowing that and more of the problem-based are successful for the knowing how. And so I go back to what I raised before, problem-based learning. The biggest problem with problem-based learning are those religious messiahs who say, I'm a problem-based learning teacher. Get out of our schools. You're fired. Kenny Rogers was right. There's a right time to use it, and there's a wrong time. If the students don't have sufficient content and know-how before they go into problem-based learning, it doesn't work. And of course, the problem-based learning people say, oh, yeah, I know that. So don't use problem-based learning methods to teach the content. It doesn't work. What about explicit instruction? The opposite story. Oh, yes, of course, I can use explicit instruction to teach that. Tech sizes are very low. The answer is two. Why don't we do both? Why can we please stop this crazy debate that you've got to be explicit or problem solved? You've got to look at content or the knowing how side of things. Be greedy. I want both. And I invite any students in the room, if you want a topic for a master's or a PhD, invent a new method that covers both. And it's really interesting. There's, of all the 80 or 100 odd different methods that I've investigated, there's only one that crosses all five parts of the model. How many of you know how to use the jigsaw method? Uh, 1.20. And it works because it deliberately focuses on all parts of it. Come on, Hong Kong. Come up with a method that covers all five to compete with the jigsaw method. You could transform teaching dramatically. And my point here is, even though 2008, the effect size was very low, it doesn't mean we get rid of it. We understand why it's low. It's introduced too early. It's introduced by those who think students are already. Go back to first year medicine. The effect size is zero to negative. Problem-based learning in fourth year medicine has an effect size of 0.5. There's a right time, there's a wrong time. Kenny Rogers was right. I'm doing work at the moment uh, based on Helen Bowd's work out of Singapore where I'm mapping classrooms. That's, and I'm looking at this lesson and so you can see this lesson that teacher actually starts over here with kind of more problem-based. She uses that to find out what the students know and don't know, what, how they can do what they can't do, and she goes back and teaches it. And you can see she switches. And I think that's a very desirable strategy, teacher using their evaluative judgment to make the difference. What do you think of this class? I think it's a great class. If, if this is class one, Next class, they move out here. If they keep at this level, which is what I'm arguing most teachers do, unfortunately, despite what they say, at least from the student's point of view, that's not good. But there's nothing wrong with having a class here, provided later they move there. This one here, the teacher deliberately wanted to teach transfer. And that's a kind of trivial example where they look at Kiwis and they switch to koalas. And we all know all quality comes out of New Zealand, so the Kiwis are probably right. But the point here is mapping what we do to make sure in our planning. And given I'm a great fan of backward design, let's ask teachers to work out what are the knowing how notions that you want to teach in a series of lessons. What are the problems you want to give your students? And then ask, what is the knowledge and the skills needed to address those problems? 
And I have to say, it's really hard to do because when teachers do this, they realize that about 90% of what they're teaching is irrelevant. But they don't like that. But it leads to a much more successful scenario for our students from going to that, from, from, from the problem solving back to the content. And as you can see, I'm not necessarily arguing that there's a right order for it. What I'm arguing is both have to be uh, uh, addressed. Now, this is the model of an intentional instruction, intentional alignment, focusing on the learner, focusing on the various attributes of the learner. We call it the visible learner, the assessment capable learner. And then from that, making sure we teach the students the strategies of learning, because it's through learning the strategies of learning that students make progress towards higher achievement, no matter where they start, no matter what their background. So that's my session for tonight. I wanted to focus particularly on that instructional alignment. I'm sure if you look at the sequel, all 500 pages, it's got a lot more detail in it, but it's trying to explain that story about how come we are surrounded by so much success, but too often we focus on the failure. I want you to focus on the success and the visible learning story is this simple. Do you have the courage to reliably identify those teachers in those schools here in Hong Kong that have an incredible impact on their students. There's many of them. Form a coalition of success around them, and then invite those in the yellow zone to join. The biggest problem in education is courage. Thank you.